So I'll just remind you quickly at what point we were yesterday. So last time, the thing we discussed was that, OK, so O is uh, an order in an imaginary quadratic field, so something like this, where D is less than 0. And so N is an element of this. And we define the congruence subgroup A, B, C, D, where the so these now belong to O. The determinant is 1, and N divides C. And uh, so the, the, uh, the phenomenon which we want to discuss is that when we take this group and abelianize it, so this, the, the, um, the size of this, or the size of its torsion part, if it's, if it's not finite, grows exponentially. So this was with n squared. OK, so this, was, this is a, I, I, I gave yesterday a more precise conjecture, and we'll revisit it later today. But that was the kind of phenomenon that we were discussing. And OK, so, so the plan of the lectures are just is that I'm, I, I, so OK. So I'm still in this. Uh, so after I, disc after I set this up, I described a heuristic uh, I'll, which at least ex very crudely uh, explains why this should be large. And so I'm, I'm going to spend more time talking about that. Uh, I'm, uh, so I discuss, I'm going to finish discussing that heuristic from yesterday, and then we'll talk about another heuristic. And probably by the end of the day, we'll start on this analytic torsion. So, uh, so this first heuristic from yesterday, so what I called heuristic A from yesterday, suggested that when you take this group and make it abelian, this should, you should model this as, so it can be modeled as, modeled as uh, integers Where, uh, so for so v1, vg, these are, uh, let's say, random vectors w with some cons uh, All right, so uh, w with entries, let's say, minus 1, 0, 1. OK, so this came from looking at how a presentation for this, this group coming from geometry might look like. All right, and, I, and, I dis, uh, and here g should be very roughly on the order of n squared. OK, so this is what we discussed yesterday. Now, uh, I, I want to make a second. Uh, I want to make, uh, explain one way in which this heuristic is, is, is definitely inadequate. So. OK, so this heuristic, as I said, it's a crude heuristic. It very roughly uh, correctly predicts the size of this. But if you ask about anything finer, it's, it, it's really wrong. So let's, uh, let's examine what this says about, so so far I just discussed its size. Let's look at its actual group structure, what this suggests about the group structure. Of, of, 
Okay, so if we're going to talk about the, in other words, is it a cyclic group or a product of cyclic groups or so on? And, and I'll explain that this heuristic really gives you a wrong picture if you ask such a fine question. So there's, there's something essentially missing with this and it's sort of important to be aware of that. Okay, so if we're going to talk about the group structure, we might as well look at it prime by prime. Okay, so if you believe this heuristic, let's just look at a single prime p, I'll let, and I'll look at the p part. Okay, so in other words, I throw away everything, that, I throw away all the torsion that's prime to p. Okay, so I just keep whatever factors of z mod p, z mod p squared, and so on. So if you believe this, you, you would think, I, I'll write, so I'll write this meaning, this can be modeled as, you, you take, now, p adic integers to the g quotiented by, so if you believe this, it's reasonable to believe that, it, let's just sort of take p parts everywhere, where these v1 up to vg, uh, you, you, choose them random, uh, you, you choose random vectors in zp to the g. Uh, up here, there was some 0, minus 1, 1 entry, but you don't expect that should have any influence on the group structure. Okay, it's a kind of an Archimedean constraint, not a... Okay, so if you believe this, you think maybe this is, a, this is a reasonable model for how the p part of this behaves. You take some fairly large number g, you take zp to the g, and you quotient it by this. Now, this... All right, so this is some way to produce a, a p group. And in fact, it's a, it's a, this way has already shown up yesterday in, in a different context. So, so in fact, the, um, you can very precisely understand what, uh, what this process produces. Okay, so if you take, so quotienting zp to the g by g random elements, uh, vg, at least in the limit as g goes to infinity, it produces exactly the same distribution that you see in the cohen lenstra heuristics. So I, I, I'll say this precisely. It produces the cohen lenstra distribution. Okay, so by this I mean that it, if you, so if g is a finite abelian p group, then, okay, let's look at the probability, the probability that, z, all right, so take some integer g, pick, so to speak, a g by g matrix of p adic numbers at random and do, do this quotienting by the rows of that matrix. The probability that you get g will be exactly the probability that we see in cohen lenstra which is the product from 1 to infinity, 1 minus 1 over p to the i, divided by the number of automorphisms of g. All right, uh, I, I, let me say it's not maybe so relevant for our story, but in a second I'll, I'll, I'll say why you expect to see this exactly the same thing in the cohen lenstra context. Okay, that, that, that's a separate but interesting story. But what I do want to say is that, in particular, just as Fufri dis discussed in his lectures, the probability of getting a group like z mod p to the k is very small. Okay, so Fufri discussed z mod 3 times z mod 3. If you do z mod 3 to the k, this probability will be on the scale of p to the minus k squared. And if you look at data, if you go look at it, it's some, at a table of data of this, you, a bunch of different n, you look at the abelianization, you see that it, this is not realistic. Okay, you see many factors of z mod p much more often than you would expect. Okay, so this doesn't match. The data. Okay, so I'll say this is, so this is, uh, uh, I think there's a, a clear guess as to what is missing from this heuristic. But let me just have a, a small aside 
about why the same thing shows up in the Cohen Lenstra context. Are there any questions up to here? Yeah. So you choose a metronome with uh, yeah. Cohen and trees minus one zero one? Uh, OK, so, so for the ease of analysis, let's say we choose them at random with respect to the Haar measure. OK? However, in practice, I know there are, there are theorems of the sort, but I'm not, I kind of don't know what the state of the art is. But in practice, if, if you simulate this, you find pretty much any way you pick them, you will get the same distribution. OK, that is minus one. Any reasonable distribution, it seems it's very insensitive to how you pick them experimentally. But when I make a statement like this, let's say that I mean that vi are chosen uniformly with respect to Haar measure. Any other questions? OK, so this is a slight aside, but I, I thought it was worth making because we're, all, we're also t talking about the cohen lenstra heuristics in another course. So why should this show up? Why does this uh, show up when you model when uh, studying class groups? Oh, one thing I wanted to say is this equality here. Is, oh, oops, someone should have said, sorry. Limit as g goes to infinity. OK. OK, the convergence here is extremely fast. OK, so as long as g is slightly more than the number of generators for g, this would already be very close. Uh, and the proof of this is very is very is an elementary exercise in algebra. Okay, it's not much harder than knowing the number of invertible matrices over FP. Okay, so why does this? Why should this same distribution, which I've said is not correct in this case, but what, why does it show up in studying class groups? The point is that you can also so so the, if you take K as an imaginary quadratic field. Okay, so the class group of K is by definition the group uh, of all ideals quotiented by the group of principal ideals. Okay. Now, this is the quotient of two you know, infinite groups. Okay. So, but you can replace this by something that's kind of finite and easier to analyze as follows. So, so let, let's say let S be a large set of prime ideals. So for example, maybe you take all the ideals with norm, e.g. all with norm less than some very large number. Like, it, it, this should depend on k, so some big number. And so if S is large enough, you can replace this by kind of finite version, where we just look at those ideals gener the, the, the ideal generated by primes in S. OK, so you look only at those ideals who have all their factors in S. And you quotient only by the principal ideals intersect this set. OK, so principal intersect the same set. This. OK, now this top thing here, so it's what you can get from all the primes in S. It's clearly a, a free abelian group of rank equal to the size of S. OK? The bottom thing, it comes from all elements of K. Principal ideals are just things generated by K, but they should have all their factors in S. OK, so this, in other words, comes from, OK, um, this. This, sorry about that. This comes from the S units, OK? The elements of K, all of whose prime factors lie in, uh, lie only in S. And Dirichlet's unit theorem shows you this is also a free group of rank S. OK, that's where the, the, fa the imaginary quadratic is used. If it were a real quadratic, it would be S plus 1 at this point. And that you would get it. So the point is the class group of an imaginary quadratic field is naturally presented as a quotient, in other words, of some free abelian group modulo the same number of relations. OK? So in some sense, so that kind of explains heuristically why you should expect this distribution. OK? There would need to be some conspiracy among these relations for it not to happen. 
So that, this model of group shows up. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it, it also shows up in other contexts. It's a very natural model that you take some number of, a large number of generators and quotient by the same number of relations. It's, OK, now, what was I going to say? I was going to say, yes, w w uh, what has gone wrong here? Uh, are there any questions? So the, uh, yeah, uh, the sh I think the short thing which has gone wrong is that this, uh, so let, let me say it this way. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something. With, uh, oh, yeah. So suppose we looked not at this, but we looked at a gamma that was a similar, a group that was not arithmetic. Okay. So you take one. Uh, so you take something like a hyperbolic three manifold, which is not arithmetic, and you take its fundamental group, and you did, the, and you go through the same story. Well, in fact, Nathan Dunfield and Thurston showed that un, at least under a certain model of random such groups, you really do get this Cohen-Lenstra distribution. OK, so, so the, the fact this doesn't seem to hold is, some, is related to the arithmeticity of, so it's somehow related to, so this is, uh, this is related to the, uh, uh, the failure of the model to account for, for arithmetic symmetries. Which, uh, and by that, I mean the Hecke operators. OK, this model knows nothing about the Hecke operators. And the Hecke operators are, uh, greatly change the. All right, so let me just finish. Uh, there's, a, there's a very similar phenomena to this failure. So I'll, I'll just comment on that, and then we'll be done with this uh, heuristic. OK, but so in other words, uh, yeah, this, this, heurist, this is the, the main point. This heuristic doesn't account for the Hecke operators. This, this is one way in which it becomes visible. It gets the group structure wrong. Right, so you know, what we did here is I took a random G by G piadic matrix, and I formed a group out of it. And that's its distribution. And the story it has some parallels. This. Uh, This has some parallels with, with the kind of classical random matrix theory. OK, so just to give you an example of such a parallel, uh, here I wrote the, so this probability of that, that you get z mod p to the k. OK, I said it's very small. Why is it so small? It's because this G by G matrix is most unlikely. It doesn't want to have many eigenvalues near 0. OK, so this is actually exactly the same phenomena that if you take, I, I think if I, if I did compute right in the GUE uh, matrix ensemble, so random Hermitian matrices, the probability that you have k eigenvalues in a window in a window of scaled length epsilon has exactly the same behavior. OK, it's epsilon to the k squared. So there's some the sort of cohen lenstra story has some reflection of what you see in random matrix theory. It's much easier than random matrix theory. Okay, this, but it, it, you see some parallels. And in particular, this failure, there's a parallel failure to, to do with random matrix theory. So the failure of this naive model to, um, well, OK, above. So it's kind of similar to a, 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 an analytic failure, which is that to the, the failure of say, G, uh, of random matrix of um, random matrix theory to model the eigenvalues of, OK, so, so if, it, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, it's not going to matter. But I'll just say this. To model the eigenvalues of 
gamma mod the upper half plane if gamma is arithmetic. So something physicists noticed about 20 years ago is that typically if you take a quotient of the upper half plane and you take its Laplacian eigenvalue, the, the gap statistics look like random matrices. But they don't if it's arithmetic. Okay, and that's so, sort of presumably because the presence of Hecke operators forces it to behave in a non-generic way. And so th th this failure is kind of parallel to that one. Okay, this uh, where there are some similarities to this. Okay, so that I think that's the end of the first heuristic, and now I want to. So th 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 now I want to talk about the second heuristic, which is much more specialized, but it also gives me a chance to talk about some of the reasons one might be interested in this in this story in the first place. Are there any questions? All right, so, so for heuristic B, I have to describe a little bit the relation of this to the, to the Langland story. So, so let me start by saying one, uh, let, let me start by briefly uh, saying something which happens in the classical case over Q, and, and then I'll describe the parallel phenomena in this setting and why it's, it's in a way more interesting. So over Q, right, so if, if we have F which is a weight two, so F is a weight two holomorphic form of level N, uh, so uh, with rational coefficients, and a Hecke eigenform. And so let, let's say okay, so it looks like some some a n to the q n. So Eichler and Shimura made this wonderful discovery that they could associate to f an elliptic curve. So this is due to Eichler and Shimura e. Call it E sub F, which is an elliptic curve. And it has this amazing property that this AP here is related to the number of points on this over FP. Okay, so number of points of this over FP. So this is due to Eichler and Shimura. Okay, so that's this P plus one minus AP. And in fact, you don't, there's a way you can just kind of, if you, if you don't even have to remember the full elliptic curve, one can just remember the Galois representation on the Tate module. Okay, so, so if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll so Galois representation so I'm just saying this so that if you've seen it, uh, it, it'll make contact with what I'm about to next, but it, it doesn't matter if you have not seen it. And this has the prop, some property, trace of rho, that its traces on Frobenius elements are related to these APs. Okay, th so that's the story over Q. Now, let, let me now say the, the, correspo uh, the corresponding story over our imaginary quadratic. Uh, So over our ring of integers in an imaginary quadratic field. Now, yeah, maybe I should just remind you that, as I said at the start of yesterday, if we didn't know about the space of weight two forms, we could nonetheless extract all the information in it from the just abelianizing this group. OK, so as far as the Hecke operators go, they have exactly the same information. So over O. All right, so I, now uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, for example, here there's, a, the, there's also a statement that the coefficients are not rational, but I just stuck to this because it's simple. So again, here, let me make the, the, the simplest statement I can, and then I'll say something to try to make it a little more palatable, and then I'll talk about the, uh, so it uh, involves the work of many people. 
So uh, let me start. So the simplest, I'm, I'm restricting to a simple case to make this simple, uh, to make this. So let's suppose that we are in a setting where the p part of this, OK, so gamma naught n here, right? We, we're in this, uh, uh, not, now I'm over this imaginary quadratic field. Let's suppose that the p part of this just consists of a single factor of z mod pz. Okay, it's not important, but it, it just makes the statement as clean as I can make it. All right, and then in this setting, all right, so let me pick an element, a non-zero element here, which I'll call alpha. So here, you can make a, gal a representation. So it goes from the Galois group of, so k is going to be the corresponding quadratic field. So it goes from the Galois group of k bar over k to GL2 FP. Ah, let me write GL2 Z mod P. So it's the same. Okay, same p here and here. So I'll, I'll write it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, um, in a special case, I'll, I'll try to make it a little more friendly. So, and it has the following properties. I, it has many properties. I'm not listing all of them, but two important ones are it is unramified outside n times p, and for any prime q, the way the, the q teke operator acts on this alpha is by multiplication by trace of the Frobenius at q. OK, if you've never seen this kind of thing, this looks uh, like, like sort of incomprehensible. So, uh, let me just pick a special case and try to uh, uh, try to make this a little more friendly. And uh, so, by the way, this is a lot harder. Okay, this, uh, I'm going to talk about the history of this in, in, in a second. But this is a lot. This is not due to equations. This is much harder. Uh, so uh, let's just to illustrate the the kind of what this means. Let's take the case when p is. Yeah, it should be rho. Yeah, let's call it rho. Let's just call it rho. OK. In this setting, I just have this one. Yeah, thank you. P is prime to n. P is prime to n. Um, it does, I don't think it, it matters, but maybe this, 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 there's only one n. But I, I don't think it matters that p is prime to n. Oh, wait, what did you say is prime to n? Oh, yeah. OK, but maybe q should be prime to n. Yeah. OK, so let's just take the example when p is 2. OK, so I, I just want to spend some time saying that, that this, uh, you know, how, how should one think about this? OK, because it, so when p is 2, I mean, in practice, uh, so let's say p is 2. So you, you do abelianize this, and you see that the 2 part is just a z mod 2. In practice, if you actually do this, a lot of the, you'll have this annoyance. This won't be surjective a lot of the time. But let's say it is surjective. So say that rho is surjective. So what I'm going to try to do is translate this right-hand side into something more down to earth. So rho goes from the Galois group of k bar over k. It goes to GL2, z mod 2z. And this is a group with six elements. Uh, it's isomorphic to the symmetric group on three letters. OK, so to give this map, to give the map from the Galois group to S3 is exactly the same as giving a cubic field. OK, so rho determines. Uh, so to give rho is equivalent to giving a cubic field, which is not Galois. OK, so a cubic extension. and. Uh, yeah, if it's not Galois, you will get a S3 extension from it. And now I'll translate these other two properties, A and B. Okay, so A says that this L 
the discriminant of L is divisible only by only by primes Q dividing n times p. And condition b says, if you translate, if you just go through the translation, what it says is that if you, OK, so I have this. Here is this alpha. One thing I've sort of said here without explaining is that there really is a way that the Hecke operators act on this. Okay, so I sort of I said this at the very start when we were discussing weight two forms. I said the Hecke operators act here, and it's kind of they compatibly act here. Okay, so if you sort of think through this and figure out how to translate the Hecke action here to here, then the same exactly the same thing works over here. Okay, I but I never wrote out I never actually wrote it wrote down the definition, but whenever you do this, uh, take an arithmetic group and abelianize it, the Hecke operators act on it. So the alpha is an eigen form, this is automatic? Or? It's automatic in this case because I, I assume that the p part is just c mod p. Yeah. So, uh, right, and this other assertion says that, what does b say? It says tq of alpha is non-zero if and only if q, so q is a prime of k, is inert in L. OK, so when you, uh, uh, so something that at least at some point I did to try to make myself feel better about this is for small p, you can translate these assertions to things about explicit number fields and the way that primes split in them. And then you can, you, can, you can go and test it numerically. And it's very satisfying to see you can, uh, so as you see, for small p, this is really these statements, the content of the statement is something very explicit. OK, so I'm going to talk a bit about the history of this. Are there any questions? All right, so this was, so on the one hand, you, in some way, you expect it perhaps by analogy with this. But there's something. So let me first say, so it, it, this has been proven very recently by Peter Schultze. But I, I, I want to say some of why it's, it's so much more subtle than this, OK? And some of the, the history of it. When we look at, in the case over Q, as, we, as I said yesterday, this thing is essentially, it's more or less a free group, OK? So I, I said yesterday it's some many copies of Z plus a small finite group. Okay. Now, the problem you have here is some, a situation like this. This Z mod PZ is not detected by anything in the classical theory of automorphic forms. Okay, the classical theory of automorphic forms, it has things in objects that exist only in characteristic zero, like Laplacian eigenfunctions and holomorphic forms. And so it has no hope of seeing this. And actually, so the... Um, the reason I got interested in this problem in the first place is it, it, somehow all the standard techniques of automorphic. So uh, this thing, this alpha, it behaves just like a modular form. It has every right to be called a modular form, but none of our none of the existing story of uh, the classical techniques apply to it. And in fact, so the idea that you should you should be looking at these um, so. Uh, that one should think about the, the possibility this has torsion and that you might have this sort of story goes back. So, uh, so I, I think it was predicted, and maybe Clozel knows more about the, the history. Uh, I think uh, uh, Avner, Ash, Clozel, and Taylor already uh, knew about this from the 1980s. Is it fair to say? I think that's fair, but Sam knew about it. <laughs> OK, so there's something to be said here. It's not obvious this is something you should be looking at. And it's not obvious that there is this torsion phenomenon here at all. So it, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a insight to realize this is something worth, worthy of study. 
Anyway, uh, to, to, uh, this goes back to the, uh, one of the main motivations for studying this with um, this conjecture I made with Nicolas Bergeron was to show that this kind of phenomenon, this torsion, is actually complete. It's not some sort of strange exception, but it's in, in, for once you go away from gr groups like SL2 and Shimura varieties, it's actually the norm. Okay, this is uh, what you see is primarily torsion, and you see very little in characteristic zero. Okay, so all this was this is not, was just to give you some context. Of, so this st story fits in some ha, ha, must be a part of the Langlands program. Okay, and uh, still, so now Schultze has proved this analog of the Eichler Shimura story, but uh, the amount we know about this is still vastly, vastly less than. Okay, so very few of the tools that we know about characteristic zero modular forms can be applied here. There's also a converse to this assertion, okay, which is not known. So, the, the, so I'll, let me say, I'll just put it in quotes as Sayre's conjecture. Sayre's conjecture is usually un, understood as a statement about Q, where it's the rational, where it's proven. But so this is a it should be so it's a conjectural converse. And I've said this in the kind of a very simple case where this is z mod p. But even if this is z mod p squared, but whatever this is, there is some precise statement you can make whereby you can exactly predict this in terms of Galois theory. Okay. All right, so that's a very short description of how this relates to the Langlands program. And now I'll, I will come back to uh, the question of its size. Are there any questions? I mean, if you have three parts of your group, the Galois representation in principle can come from some characteristic zero model form, or you always predict it should come from torsion. No. Uh, okay. So sorry. But when I when I mean this no notation, let's say I, I literally meant it z mod p. But suppose, as you said, suppose this lifted to characteristic zero, then correspondingly this would lift to a p-adic and presumably even geometric representation. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So, all right. So now back to the question of size. To the size. All right, so if you have some description of this in terms of Galois theory, you might try to figure out you know, how large this is by seeing how likely it is that such rho exists. So I'm going to say this very, uh, this deserves more explanation than I have time for. But so by a non abelian version, of the cohen lenstra heuristics. So I, I explain why I say this in one moment. The probability the, that such a row exists should be roughly 1 over p. OK, so uh, let me just compare here. To, uh, uh, let me say why I'm mentioning cohen lenstra so, so the usual cohen lenstra heuristics say that for an ima imaginary quadratic field k, they say, so for k imaginary quadratic, the probability that p divides the size of the class group is this number, which uh, is 1 minus that number up there. So 1 minus the product from 1 to infinity, 1 minus 1 over p to the i. And sorry? Yeah, I think this is a. Uh, so, so it's, I apply a statement above to g equals 1 and then take the. So this is, 
All right, now this is roughly 1 over p to first order. Okay, but we can reinterpret this in the following way. Okay, this is the same as the probability that there's a non-trivial homomorphism from the class group to z mod pz. Okay, and by class field theory, this is the same as there being an unramified homomorphism from the Galois group. OK, so this way, you can think about the cohen lenstra heuristics as telling you, so measuring something about how likely is it that you have a abelian extension of a number field. And in this context, the answer is, in, is supposedly 1 over p. So when I say a non-abelian version of these heuristics, what I mean is some, something that describes for you the chance of you having a homomorphism in the Galois group is some non-abelian group. Okay, and this exists. I, I would say so, uh, f largely due to uh, to work of Bargava. So, so let's say Bargava formulated this for the symmetric group, and then if you if you take what he did and then you apply it very recklessly, you come to this this claim. OK, so, so suppose you, you believe this for a moment. Is it, is it the same as what the Fulham question did for columns with my uh, Yes, in some, I, I think, yes, in some idealized situation when there's no Archimedean story. The Archimedean story is very problematic because some elements are forced to be of order two. And so, so if there were no Archimedean places, it would be like that. Yeah, that, that, uh, but sorry, maybe I should say that. So, so another way, how would you guess what these heuristics are is related to what Emmanuel said. If you didn't know them, one way you can do it is you can think about a function field case, and there is sort of a clear guess of what the answer is. So, so that's how you might discover this if you didn't know it. OK, uh, where are we? So if you accept this, and I, and I admit we're somehow deep in the realm of heuristics here, but if one accepts this, that says that the size, so, so how big is this group going to be? Well, it's going to be at least for every p, every prime occurs with the probability of 1 over p. And this is infinity. So you might think it's problematic that this heuristic predicts infinity for an integer. But um, I, I think, the, so. If you were to, you could apply the cohen lenstra heuristics the same way to predict, try to guess. If you just went prime by prime and applied the cohen lenstra heuristics to guess the size of a class group, it would predict that imaginary fields have infinite class group and real fields have finite class group. OK, so, so you should take this with a pinch of salt, but at least this suggests that it should be large. OK, one advantage of this type of heuristic is it works very well when you replace, uh, when you go to a general setting. That is, you replace SL2 by a bigger group, or you replace uh, your imaginary quadratic field by another field. This always gives an answer, and that answer seems, as far as people have been able to test it, to, to really be uh, experimentally seems so far to be right. OK, I'm not going to talk about uh, that, but that's the main virtue of this heuristic, is that it, it is very, it's much more generally applicable than the previous one. OK, so that's, I think, the end of heuristics. And now I'm going to talk, uh, we, we will talk about uh, next about analytic torsion. And to start that, I'm just going to talk about, uh, I'll introduce just hyperbolic three space. Uh, so I'll, I'll just be making, I think, definitions for today so that I can, we can look at the formula next time. Are there any questions? Yeah. So, uh, gamma naught and uh, I've analyzed gamma naught and is peak. That means uh, it has to have a peak part. Uh, no, it, well, it's unclear. You know, uh, it's somewhat open to interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, I, I interpret it in the way that I want to, which is that the, the torsion part is getting very large. Yeah. So it's yeah. Like, for example, if you literally apply this heuristic, it predicts that the probability that uh, modular forms exist is zero. So, so there, uh, you have to be a little bit careful about w w the realms w w where you apply it. But uh, anyway, I'm not saying so. I found this to be 
quite reliable as long as you're a bit cautious about how you use it. All right. So now, let, so okay. So, so now we're going to talk about analytic torsion. But well, maybe I maybe I write the formula now, and then the, the, the our job will be to define the quantities that are in it. Okay. So this formula. Uh, well, again, let me attribute it after I write it. So what I'm about to say is true. So true if. Uh, oh dear. OK, it, 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 it would be true if this quotient were compact. And if not, there's a, it's a much more delicate story. So I'll, I'll write a formula which is literally true in this case. The size of gamma naught n torsion part abelianized times r, this is this regulator, which will be the, uh, the the thing we, which I now feel is kind of the most interesting part of the story. This is equal, oh, now divided by the volume hyperbolic volume. So I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about this hyperbolic space and we'll define the quantities one by one. Is equal to determinant of so over here, there'll be two. OK, these uh, delta naught and delta 1 will be Laplacian operators. And, and we'll, well, I'll, I'll define them. Laplacians on gamma naught n mod h3. This is the Laplacian on functions, that is, usual mass forms. This is the function of one forms, so mass forms with some weight. And we need to discuss how you take the determinant of such a thing. All right, this is a, really, it's a remarkable formula because it says that this object, which is uh, something of discrete group theory, you can compute in an analytical way. And so, the, so it was conjectured by Ray and Singer. And I think. So in particular, it, when Ray and Singer conjectured this, in particular, they defined this in the first place. OK, so as far as I understand, the, the, the definition of this how to take a determinant of something infinite dimensional was, not, was, was due to them. So I think it's tremendously insightful that they guessed such a formula could exist. I'll, I'll say something next time about how you might guess that. But it's, it's an incredible thing just to guess it's there. And it was proved maybe by Cheeger and Mueller independently. And also, I'll say a couple of words. But this formula has nothing to do with number theory. So, so a version of this is true for any a version is true with gamma naught n mod h3 replaced by any compact Riemannian manifold. So I said yesterday, another way you can think of this right-hand side is as a special value of a, a, a Selberg zeta function. OK, so I'll, I'll also say more a little bit about that next time, if there's time. OK, but for, for now, all, I, haven't, I want to define all the quantities here. This one we've seen. Uh, let me uh, uh, define a hyperbolic three space in the volume. Oh, and one thing to say is that this r, this r has to be defined too. But for now, just say r is one if um, r is one if this abelianization were actually finite. Okay, so this r is the me is some measure of the size of the free part. So it's a regulator. All right. So maybe just a few minutes on the hyperbolic space, and then we'll. Are there any questions about that? All right, so just like, so I've already written it up here. So 
So just as SL2R, so okay, hyperbolic three space. All right, so uh, when you study SL2Z, a basic fact is it and even the bigger group SL2R act on the hyperbolic plane, okay, which I'll write as H2 for the moment. So in other words, that's, a, that's all, as a space, it's just a positive half of the complex plane. But what's useful about it, well, one of the things which is important about it, this is that it has a metric that's invariant. So a Riemannian metric where, and that's invariant by SL2R. And then when, you know, base the thing So to some extent, we try to study a group like this through the geometry of this. So the analog in this case up here is that SL, for example, SL2 of O, O is my z of square root d. This sits inside SL2C. And this acts on sort of an analogous story one dimension higher. OK, so I'll just say the bare uh, sort of bare outline of it, it acts on a, th a three-dimensional analog of this space. And in fact, everything is very similar, just one dimension up. So this space is now, you can think of it as three coordinates, x1, x2, y, where y is positive. The metric is exactly the same formula. The action, here the action is by fractional linear transformations. Here you can uh, see it as being by fractional linear transformations when you think of these in some quaternionic way. But instead of writing that, I'll just, I'll just show you how some, uh, a, a few basic classes of things here act. So, so for example, the element one. Uh, so sometimes I, I, I think it's, we can also think of this space, we'll, we'll think of it as being, um, Hmm. Yeah, so it's sometimes nice to think of this as being inside the complex plane times the positive reals, where the complex coordinates are x1 plus i, x2, and y. Okay, and if you think of it this way, so uh, 1 alpha 0 1 acts on sends x1 plus this, this thing here translates in the complex plane x1 plus i, x2 plus alpha y, and this element here, this dilates both the, the entries. So it sends x1 plus i, x2, y to t squared x1 plus i, x2, and then absolute value of t squared y. Okay, and finally the element, an element like 0, 1, 1, 0 acts by kind of inversion. So anyway, you have this geometry now to, and one, one thing which you, you get, even before you do anything fancier, is that So just the fact that this acts on this geometry gives you something already. So the volume of, you can form the quotient. Okay, so let, let me just say in the simplest cases, just like the fundamental domain for SL2Z looks like this, in the small discriminant cases, the fundamental domain for that just looks like a sort of three-dimensional version where you have like something like that. Okay, that's a typical picture, fundamental domain for these things are kind of built out of things like that. So, right. So you can, you can now measure this because you have this metric. And just that fact is useful. This gives a kind of an intrinsic measure of the, the complexity or, or of, oh, let's write this gamma naught n. 
complexity or if you want size. OK, the fact that this gives you some number, which in some way measures how large this group is. So in terms of this number, I wrote a conjecture last time. Now let me, uh, let me rewrite it in slightly more generality. So my conjecture with Bergeron, so uh, the conjecture of mine and Bergeron states that, and it's, it's naturally phrased this way, is that if you take the logarithm of the size of this torsion, so the scale, right, last time I scaled by n squared, but the natural thing to scale by is this volume. Then you get, this should go to 1 over 6 pi. OK, now this is not the way I stated it last time. So to recover the form from last time, so the version from last time, you can use the uh, Humbert, uh, the, the volume formula, which was proven by Humbert in the 19th century. OK, and what that says is that the volume of hyperbolic 3 space modulo SL2 of O, where O is the order of discriminant D, is given by uh, absolute value of D to the 3 halves over 4 pi squared times the zeta function of Q squared minus D at 2. OK, so in the case I had last time, this d was minus 1. d was minus, well, d was plus 1. And the zeta function of q of i at 2 is pi squared over 6 times this Dirichlet L function. OK, so this, is, so this constant which appeared last time, really it comes from the value of a zeta function of this quadratic field. OK, so it's, it's really a measure of hyperbolic volume, nothing more. OK, so maybe this is a good point to stop. And next time, I'll, we will discuss the other, the, what, what the other things in this formula mean and a little bit about what we can do with it. Now we have questions. Is there anything we can compare this to in the SL2Z case? What's that? The formula? Oh, yeah, the formula of an S. Oh, oh not that one, the, the cheater molar. The right model. Ah, well, the problem is in even dimension, this tends to is, is, at least if you don't twist it in some way, it's one for trivial reasons to do with duality. So it, it has interest only in the, the odd dimensional case, at least if it's not twisted in some way. Another question.